Well, hi everyone, and welcome to our session on Schools for Thinking. Just to let you know right away, I'll be placing this slide at different times into this session, and I encourage you really strongly to stop, to pause, and to debrief on the sort of things that I offer in the time up until that slide. Three questions that I just love using with students near the end of a lesson. What basically means, well, what was said? Or perhaps what were the three key things that I just heard? So what is, uh, what are the implications? Uh, you know, where did that come from? Uh, what could I possibly do with that? Now what is very specifically what you will do with it, not might, but will. So please make use of that slide as we go along. I was walking down a side alley in Hong Kong once and I chanced upon this advertisement uh, for a magazine. Now, I think that the square is very 20th century. We now need to start thinking outside the dodecahedron. If you're not familiar with that, it is a 12-sided polygon. And we now need to start thinking more in very different ways. So this session here is going to offer all sorts of ideas on how you can help yourself and children to start to think outside that dodecahedron and to come up with ideas like this. I just recently found one called Soul Power. And it's an insert to place into your shoe. And as you walk around, it develops the kinetic energy that can then be transferred by this special little device through a USB connection into perhaps your phone or anything else that needs to be charged up. I love the thinking. Well, how about something like this? A young lady in Canada recently came up with the hollow flashlight. And in fact, it is charged by holding onto it with your hand and using your body heat. Or even this recent innovation with uh, bicycle lights in China, where they use a projector to place a grid on the road in front of you so you can see all the bumps very clearly in it. Or even this amazing device from this teenager in Holland who has worked out how to clean up the world's oceans by using these giant arrays. And he has already found some initial funding to come up with some test pilots on how to actually make it happen. Beautiful thinking. You'll be able to get some of that sort of thinking with what I call my Thinkers Keys. And if you go to thinkerskeys.com, I have all sorts of free downloads there, including a part version of the electronic Thinkers Keys that was released last year. So you're very welcome to download that if you wish as well. So here's what I will offer in this session. Some various ideas on developing a full school for thinking, although more specifically, I'll be focusing on classrooms. I'll also outline all ranges of different strategies on encouraging some creative and critical thinking, and also some ideas in terms of steadily putting these things into practice for the rest of the year or your life, and certainly sustaining them over a period of time. When it comes to a school itself, there are many complex ways of generating you know, intellectual quality in the place. Uh, some obvious ones. I love to see the clear indicators of thinking quality, such as the various uh, displays that are placed up in the office foyer when people first get there. Maybe it's being too judgmental, but I tend to form my first opinion of a school on that first 30 seconds uh, inside that office. So make sure that the videos just reek of innovation, of creativity, and of very, very interesting thinking. The really innovative schools tend to take part in lots of initiatives that really promote great thinking amongst the children. The various competitions and tournaments are definitely worth engaging in. Having stimulus for the teachers as well as the students, generally the best thinking schools are the ones where the teachers are great thinkers. So they also need to have a lot of fun and do various friendly competitions and do things that essentially get their thinking going as much as possible. Generally, the great schools have strong expectation for innovation and they support it really openly. And you'll see that on their displays and especially on their assemblies where some child might have come up with a very different idea and everyone adulates him or her for it. It's great to see. Perhaps we need more of this. In case you haven't heard of the X Prize Foundation before, I just love this because they find a lot of money to set up as a reward, as an incentive for people coming up with what previously would have been considered impossible. So they have prizes, for example, for the first person to land on Mars. And another one is that they uh, want people to try and develop an artificial intelligence in some form that can give a TED talk and in fact will get a standing ovation for its talk. And there are millions of dollars involved in making it happen. Love the thinking behind it. Maybe you even need things like this throughout a school. Now, I will be focusing on both primary and secondary. 
though with primaries, I sometimes find the really interesting schools have unusual names on their classroom door. No more of that 6JH sort of stuff. I found this school once that had names like this, the Wonky Banana Cafe, which had to be one of my favourites with this one. So why don't you come up with just different things like that that just inject that beautiful pizzazz into a place? I went past this dentistry practice in a country town once and I just loved its sign, pain-free dentistry, that in brackets it had for most people. Maybe we need variations on that for schools, pain-free learning for most students or most adults or most teachers. I'm just basically saying, think up something different and do it in a very exciting way. That's possibly your first chance on doing a what, so what, now what. So if you are listening to this, pause please for at least 30 seconds and do some debriefing. Let's have a look at the brain itself. Oops, sorry, wrong image. Uh, the most amazing entity in the known universe. Uh, people talk about us using 10% of it. It's not true. In fact, we're using 100% of it. We're probably just not using it very effectively. Uh, the next 50 years will be a landmark in human history because increasingly we will have an overlap between human and technology. Uh, we will see brain implants within two decades. Uh, we will probably have some form of mobile telephony built into our brains by 2040. So we'll be able to transmit thoughts to other people. Interesting times coming in terms of the brain. In terms of getting the best out of it, I love some of Norman Dorge's material from the brain that changes itself. He makes some very interesting points. Keep in mind that neuroplasticity is at its greatest in the very early years. Generally, a poor teacher in the first three years of teaching can uh, negatively impact upon a child for life. It is critical we have great teachers for those first few years. Interestingly enough, drills are still worthwhile because rote learning is necessary. Sometimes we need to see the patterning in things. They just have to be interesting. Uh, keep in mind that it's difficult to do many things at once. The brain is still not good at dividing attention. If you seriously want great thinking and learning, go deep. You must focus on one thing at a time properly. And one that fascinated me was that the same parts of the brain get activated whether you are in fact doing something or you're just imagining doing it. There is a lot to be said for what we call mental rehearsals so that you run an event in your mind before you actually do it. It is very good for you. I have seen some classrooms where students have to put their heads on a desk for a minute or so, and they have to run a brain video of them engaging in learning really productively for the rest of the lesson. Lots of ways of making use of that. Even in terms of just doing some basic brain training, uh, I have always been intrigued by the way that education systems focus so strongly on the use of the body, especially in our science, and not as often on the use of our brain. I believe we need to do more of a focus on how the brain works, and at two levels. One is the physiological in terms of its functioning at a physical level. So that's where we talk about brain foods and breathing properly and drinking water. And then the psychological, which would show how to use it as effectively as possible. With both of those, you can do lots of brain training. Funnily enough, some of the best brain training you can do is to simply do physical exercise. Uh, the brain is obviously attached to the body and it needs that blood flowing and that oxygenation of the bloodstream. So you must do lots of exercise if you want your brain to work well. Obviously to do new learnings. And that's not just children, but also growing ups as well. I believe that teachers need to make sure they learn at least one all new thing every year. You need to go to a session where you have no idea what is being said so that you have the same feeling that students do when they haven't got a clue what's happening in a classroom. Very important experience to go through. There are all the normal puzzles and Sudokus and crosswords. Generally, they're great for your thinking. Note that reading the challenges is very good for you. So we're not talking Mills and Boone. We are talking reading that pushes your limits. It is great for your brain. Even just focusing deeply on a single thing, uh, very important for brain training as well. Coming up with really different ideas, combine two entirely different things like uh, the mobile phone in your hand and the light pole that you see outside the car as you're driving along. You know, come up with an entirely new product or even just engage in simple pairing exercises uh, that get you into what is called flow and fluency. Uh, ask an obvious question like that. What else do you want to experience in your lifetime? And for five seconds back and forth, each of you have to keep coming up with new responses. It's a great activity to do in a classroom. There's some forms on brain training. 
Well, there are different ground rules in terms of embedding thinking in classrooms and schools and in life in general. Now, there are probably 50 of them, but I will offer five core ones here. And then I'll unpack on some of these as I go through the rest of this session. One very obvious one is just to teach some really good quality strategies. Uh, it's still necessary for children to know those strategies as long as they're in context. And it, to build inquiry into what we, you know, we call it inquiry that we build into everyday learning. Inquiry is massive. Inquiry simply means what the word says. It's about inquiring. We need children who do that. We need to push for stronger intellectual rigor when we use our technologies. Sometimes I wonder if we're using ICT for the sake of it rather than specifically improving the learning. We must push the intellectual rigor when we make use of it. Also to promote metacognition throughout a school, an open awareness of thinking so that children can think about their thinking and they are aware of what is happening in it all the time. So for example, if I said to you right now, what are you thinking about right here and now? That will generate that metacognitive perspective in your head. And it's a very important one to be able to do. And also to just simply have a very positive disposition towards thinking. It basically means you have a great attitude towards it. And I'll come up with some further ideas on that one very soon as well. There are some big issues when it comes to thinking in classrooms. Uh, I'm very uneasy with people who seem to think it's some sort of optional extra. They are the sort of people who I believe are into either raw thinking. Either we have to teach thinking or we focus on the curriculum. It's not an either or, it's both and. No matter how much curriculum is enforced on teachers, they can still make choices as to the quality of how they deliver that curriculum. And very specifically in terms of the thinking that is involved in offering it to students. Thinking is also not just for the smart kids, it's for all kids. Uh, I do a lot of work in the gifted movement and certainly thinking is wonderful for them, except it's wonderful for everyone. Keep in mind that however well you are thinking will determine however well you are learning. So if you're that serious about quality learning, make sure you focus on their thinking. And your thinking is just as important. It's probably the single biggest influence on how students think in a classroom. We all know how powerful modeling is in so many different ways, and even more so when it comes to thinking. We're also finding more and more that the various media very strongly influence how and what children think and maybe even how we teach as well. We just have to accept that we are in competition these days and we have to match it as much as we possibly can. There are many frameworks for thinking. Here are some of them. Bloom's taxonomy has been around for a long time. It still has credibility as far as I'm concerned. Just keeping in mind that all levels are important. Some people seem to think that the higher realms are the only significant ones, yet funnily enough, even just the remembering and understanding levels are equally important. I know a seven-year-old who was obsessed with dinosaurs and wrote a book about some particular era, and he was obsessed with facts about them. He was a very intelligent child. All levels are very important. Williams Taxonomy is more a creative perspective on a taxonomy of thinking, and it's got heaps of merit too. Marzono's taxonomy is almost like a Bloom's but with emotional intelligence built in, which is a little bit lacking with the Bloom's perspective. Art Costa's Habits of Mind has great merit. Uh, his 16 Habits of Mind are beautiful and I think need to be built into every education system. De Bono's Six Hats is a great system, partly because of its simplicity. I've put together my Thinker's Keys and it's now in its third iteration and it's used in something like 28 countries around the planet. There are probably many more as well. You can use lots of different frameworks and I think that's fine as well. But I am gonna talk about going deeper than just the frameworks, including your focus on the actual skills involved in thinking. A lot of people break thinking up into two categories. Uh, one is creative, the other critical. I quite like going with metacognitive as well, which is often combinations of both, but it explicitly focuses in on those meta levels where you have to think about your thinking. However, if you're that serious about generating great thinking, just make sure you build these words into your planning as much as possible. And please have a balance between the creative and critical. Given that, can I make the point that one of the most important thinking skills that will be necessary for young people up ahead is to be able to synthesize information. We are now so swamped with data on this planet that it's impossible to know it all. And one of the biggest skills necessary will be the one where you can decide what is most important. You can cut a lot of information down to its core essence. 
Another perspective on that is what we call curation. And it's where you curate, you cut to the core essence. So just using those words is enough to boost really good thinking in a classroom. I mentioned before the notion of having a really positive disposition for thinking. There are lots of ways of doing this. Make it spicy. Find out who the models are for life in the students you teach. And if you can, see if you can find out information about how they think. For example, before an important sporting event or prior to going on stage to give a great performance. And set up situations where you have a, a photo on a wall uh, or in a booklet of these heroes of theirs and do the cartoon type bubble, 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 and then write in the sort of thinking they're doing as they're doing those particular events. Make thinking obvious. Generate a really good enthusiasm in children for, you know, being curious about things. There's a lot to be said for curiosity and just wanting to play with things as well. Can I also add laughter is critical with the curiosity. They both trigger the brain to do some very exciting thinking. Funnily enough, in a very rushed society, I wonder if we're not if we're giving children enough time now to simply think and process different things. We're rushing quickly and we're finding that teachers often only have a three second wait before they insist on an answer from a child. No, you must give them more time. I reckon I'm a reasonable thinker and I even need more than three seconds to respond to things sometimes. And so do children. Also encourage them just to simply plan to get organized. For example, that idea of putting their head down on the desk and seeing you know, the lesson coming up, ask children to perhaps think through the three or four things they're about to do firstly, and it will then make it much easier for them to actually launch in and to do those particular activities. Perhaps use what I call the intellectual rubber band to push thinking in classrooms. With this one, I begin with the normal question that was about to be asked, or it might be the generative question or the core question for a unit. And before you present it to the class, just by yourself, you stretch it way beyond where you could possibly use it. Perhaps rewrite the question so that the world authority on that topic would even struggle with it. Then come back to as close as you can to the first question, but still make it as hard as possible. It's called the intellectual rubber band, and there is a lot of merit to using it every time you're about to ask a question yourself. Get deeper into knowledge. There is enough research around now about Googleization for us to realize that it's becoming a little bit disquieting. It's where we skate around on the surface and only deal with a shallow interpretation of events as compared to going into depth and substance on them. I always encourage teachers to study at least one concept in great depth. In America, they will say they'll talk about an inch wide and a mile deep rather than the other way around. Well, most definitely, we need to go very deep on some things and truly learn how to study it in depth. Here is a really practical one for you in terms of thinking. Teach children to do what I call self-talking. I have done this with five-year-olds. I've done it with 15-year-olds. I've done it with 70-year-olds. Basically, you learn how to engage in a dialogue inside your head. An obvious way of doing it would be to write up some words like, this is a great school. And then for a couple of minutes, I ask a class to do this. I'll start by just asking them to say those words inside their head, but without doing any talking, not moving their lips, no sound, and just simply thinking the words at normal speaking speed. So when they do that the first time, I then ask them to do it again, but perhaps a bit more loudly in their heads. And then I'll ask them to do it again, but this time to count it off five times on their fingers. And then to finish off by getting them to just say it over and over in their heads and to be aware that they can say those words in their head. That is probably the single most critical thing I could offer to you in this session here. Teach them to self-talk. Too many children, I believe, are allowing teachers to do their thinking for them. And as a result, we're not building up self-regulation and self-responsible thinking in children. We need to allow them to do their own thinking. Here's where you'll arrive when it comes to teaching them to self-talk. On one particular day when you're perhaps doing a math lesson, you've got one boy in your class who often just puts up his hand when he can't do something. And then he'll go, oh, miss, can you please show me how to do this for the 78th time? Well, on this particular day, three months after you've taught them how to self-talk, he is about to put up his hand and he pauses. And he then goes back through his math pad and starts to work out how he did it a couple of weeks ago. He then comes back and he then actually does it himself. 
If you see him do that, you need to go down to his desk and do a little song and dance around it because he has arrived. He's taken on ownership of his own thinking. It's a very powerful thing to be able to do. You can also build that up in much more advanced ways. So I sometimes use what I call think buddies. Now, I generally only do it with primary, so there are variations with secondary. I'll ask each child to bring along some stuffed toy or you can just make glove puppets or you can have a little stick figure. It doesn't really matter as long as it's something you can hold in your hand or put on your desk. There are three simple steps to it. The first one is where you simply talk out aloud to it. Now, I have a little toy owl called Alphonse. So I've got this little bird and I can sit it in front of me and I might say, Alphonse, what do you think I need to do in terms of this particular situation? I then grab Alphonse and I shake him a bit because I pretend that I'm doing the ventriloquist thing with him. And so he talks back to me and says, well, have you thought about doing this? Then what about that and that and that and that? So I have children who are directly talking to this toy for a while, perhaps a week or so. The second step is when they don't talk out loud, but they think to it. They simply self-talk to it, and then it self-talks back to them. So again, you see this little device shaking away as it's talking back, but there's no sound coming from anywhere. The third step is when they get rid of their think buddy, but they then just learn how to have that conversation inside their heads. It's a very powerful metacognitive process. In fact, when I mentioned this to a group of teachers at one stage, one lady sent me a photo after that of her children with their think buddies. And her feedback was that they got it. They understood quite clearly how to have the conversation inside their heads just by simply using those think buddies. This perhaps would be another chance for you to do a little bit of debriefing. What, so what, now what? A further way of generating really good intellectual quality in children is to get them engaged in some intellectual dialogue. This is a photo of a little uh, thing that I have in my front veranda, and it's uh, simply a little sculpture of two ears. And when there's someone coming for lunch or dinner who talks too much, I sometimes just subtly leave it there without even mentioning why, just my mind games. I work on the premise we have two ears and one mouth in that ratio for a very specific reason. So when it comes with children, teach them how to paraphrase and engage in dialogue. As a teacher, I'm into pairing. It really does it for me. I reckon it's a way of maximising on engagement in a classroom. If it's just me talking with 28 children, I think that's only one to 28. And to some degree, I can only have one in 28 engaged at any one time. With pairing, at least one in two is engaged. So I get them to sit in pairs and I might set up a provocative question, perhaps as a result of some study of a novel we're doing. I'll ask, why did that author do that in that particular fashion? I'll then sit them in A and B in their pairs and A has to explain it for a minute or so and B then needs to paraphrase. And they start by saying something like, so you said that and then they finish off what the other person said and then they turn it the other way around. So I sometimes write up the word, so you said that right in front of people as they're about to do the activity. You'll find that most children are pretty good at it, even the young ones. Teach them how to paraphrase and it can add to the intellectual rigour of what they're talking about. I sometimes also mention the concept of small talk and big talk. Small talk is when you engage in gossip and you do what is called either or language. Or either we do this or we do that, but we can't do both. And you also often use the word but. But is a very negative word in language generally. Uh, when you put but in there, it's, you're pretty well indicating you don't agree with someone else when you respond to them. Big talk, though, is very powerful. Big talk is wonderful. Big talk is when you are speaking provocatively and positively about different things and you're talking about what can be accomplished. Very powerful to build language, quality language into a classroom. One of the simplest measures of a quality school and a quality classroom is to measure what people are talking about each day. I can pretty well guarantee that if all teachers in a school are teaching and they're talking proactively about everything, the school will be a good place. The same with each of their classrooms. When the children are speaking affirmingly about everything they're doing, it tends to be a good learning environment. Here's a further extension on that speaking engagement. Play what I call a Socrates game. Uh, I have some question starters there, and they're very Socratic. Uh, you might only use two or three of them with younger children, and you'd use all of them with 10-year-olds and above, certainly into secondary. So this one works like this. I might set up a first uh, scenario where 
I will stand there for a minute or so and explain my perspective on a different issue, uh, perhaps the human intervention in terms of global warming. While I'm talking, students with respect can put up their hands and they can ask questions like, well, why do you believe that? And, you know, what reasons do you have for saying that? And can you clarify that comment? So they have to build those questions into context with whatever I'm saying. Then I'll get them into pairs, yet again the pairs, and I'll ask one to explain his or her perspective, and the other one has to ask the questions at the right time. The good classrooms are the ones where the kids know the answers. The great classrooms are the ones where they need, they know how to ask the right questions to find out those good answers. Teach them how to ask questions and use the Socrates game. And going further in terms of that, teach them how to become very high level reflectors to be able to analyze their thinking. Now, building into this one, and this in fact is my reflection key with the thinker's keys, uh, I am very much into children being able to become meta aware of themselves. I find most high achievers, in fact, have two personalities in a sense with them. The first is their physical reality, and that's the one you are sitting there right now. The second is your meta self, and it's your watcher or your guide. There are probably some religious connotations to this. So I'm not totally sure. I just know that all high achievers have a meta self who's often giving critiques and giving quick guidance in terms of how to do something. Top teachers always do it as well. And I encourage children to do it too. At practical levels, there are all forms of self-assessment in terms of various videos being taken of them doing something, depending on the legalities in your school. Not much beats watching yourself on video when you do something. And can I also point out that as a teacher, you must video at least for 30 seconds, you're teaching at least once a month, and then going home and having a good hard look at it, and then analyzing how well you could improve on different things. Uh, getting peer feedback is very powerful. Uh, children from the age of seven or eight onwards can often coach and support each other in different ways by just watching and then giving guidance. Teachers giving feedback. Feedback is just massive when it comes to the importance of how well you encourage quality learning and thinking. I'm finding more and more teachers are nominating clearly two students at a time in a lesson and saying, during the course of this lesson, I will be giving explicit feedback to the two of you and then working through a class. Or sometimes in primary, occasionally in secondary, just choosing five per cycle or five per week and really focusing on them while still, of course, focusing on all of the students. Showing children how to set goals now, I'm a goal-setting freak. I set goals for my goals, so I'm right into it, except I think there's a lot of merit in showing children how to do this. You can set up a simple little goal sheet, and it's just got a heading at the top like, I will, and then have a couple of lines where they can write in what they will do. I will read the book called whatever, and then by, B-Y, and then a line for the date, and then at the bottom they sign it. Make up some small cards like that so that students can fill them in. So they learn how to set something, to achieve it, to it then finish off and people can then adulate them for doing it. And also being able to analyze the standards of what you do. Now we've probably done that to death and back again in terms of assessment tasks and having assessment sheets for them. Though there is some merit to children being able to analyze their standards in lots of things. So there are a few ways in terms of using the reflection key. And as I'm putting this together in terms of thinking generally, I love the concept of coding for thinking. It's where we have different standards of how we generate quality thinking in a classroom. If you're doing this on one of your teaching days, it would be worthwhile stopping for a minute and determining which level you were at in the last lesson that you gave. And if you can do that, have a go at explaining why you believe it was that level and also how you could perhaps move to the next level by the time you give another lesson. I even know one class of upper primary children where one student is quietly asked, to determine the level of that for the teacher as she finishes the lesson. And he or she will, the student will then quietly come and talk with the teacher about it. So there are many different ways of building in the concept of coding with your teaching as well. Let's go totally practical here in terms of the thinker's keys. Now, for those of you who just like straightforward ideas, you are going to get as high as 10 kites in this session here. Now, I mentioned before the website in terms of thinker's keys, uh, Years ago, I came up with a series of strategies that I believe represented the most important set of thinking required for children. And so I broke it up into critical and creative thinking. Since then, I've developed all sorts of different uh, devices for the use of it. I have an iPad app. Can I recommend that strongly to you? I think it's around $4. 
It's the single most effective way of using a whole lot of thinking strategies for children in classrooms. Now, when I set up these thinkers keys, I chose two particular colors. One's purple. Purple represents the critical thinking, the organizational thinking. So when you get hold of these, and by the way, you can get a free part version of it in that uh, thinker's key site that I mentioned. I have an icon to represent each of the thinker's keys, and then I have brief descriptions of them on the other side. So the purple is for the critical thinking. Orange is for creative thinking. This is where you outright become innovative and you generate new ideas. So again, there is an icon, and then on the other side, the descriptions of them. So what I'm going to do here is in fact mention some of these particular keys and I'll give some brief outlines in terms of how to use them. So if you are taking notes, please get ready to do so uh, because I could have actually had a whole lot of slides for each of these, but I decided I didn't want to overwhelm you completely in terms of you know, so many slides in this session. So here we go. I have a master sheet and it has the 20 keys on them with their icons. It has small squares underneath each one. So I often laminate some of these sheets. I hand them out to groups of students and I ask them to organize their thinking. So they might start by going, let's begin with purpose. So they put a little, little one underneath there. Then let's do uh, the question key. So they'll put a two underneath there. Then the brainstorming and they'll put a three. And so on it goes. It's a great way of organizing their thinking. So here we go in terms of the 20 keys. The 10 purple. Perspectives is basically to come up with different perspectives on any particular issue. I at least challenge students to come up with two different opposite perspectives on something. I sometimes play an activity called 180 degrees. They have to stand up and state their opinion on a particular issue. I then say to them 180 degrees and they have to turn around in the half circle and explain exactly the opposite perspective. Purpose is very simple and clear and yet extremely powerful. Teenagers especially need to know there is a reason for doing something. The purpose key is where you say, here is why we're doing this, here is where we're going with it. The decision key is when you come up with all sorts of different ideas, but at some point you have to make a final decision on something. For those who know what it feels like to procrastinate, you'll realize the importance of the uh, decision key. One way, by the way, of making a decision on the choice between two things is to just use a coin. And I have other strategies I've talked about in the past with this as well. The question key is where you decide upon the most important question with the particular study we're doing at the time, or the most critical question when it comes to resolving this particular issue. It's a great thinking strategy in itself. Then we have the three whys key. It's a variation on Peter Senge's five whys. It's where we drill down on a particular topic. So we might start with a statement, like we need to come to school. And underneath we write a number one and we write, well, why? And then we write our response to that. However, we then, after we write that response, write a number two and we write, well, why is that? And then we say, why is that to that first response we had? And so on, we keep going down and it often leads to some great thinking. The information key is essentially where you get your research together. Too many children on this planet think research is spelled G-O-O-G-L-E, and yet it's much more important than that. They obviously need to know how to research information properly. Research is a powerful way of generating good information and certainly good thinking. The rubrics key is used often with assessment tasks. However, I love using it with other things as well. So for example, if I want them to work in small teams, I'll sometimes set up a simple rubric of poor behavior to great behavior or dynamics when they're working in the team. And we might have two or three criteria as well, uh, such as level of contribution and level of questioning. And they then fill those in. And during the activity, I constantly refer to it. Near the end, I ask them to map out where they were in the activity based upon that. The action key is essentially what you're going to do with the thinking that you've done. So if you come up with all sorts of great ideas, what then are you going to do with them? How are you going to put them into action? The consequences key is to determine what would happen as a result of doing other things. Very powerful thinking again. I sometimes set up a line and at one end, I will write an action such as picking up a child at the tuck shop line. And at the other end of the line, I'll write a, a final consequence, which could be something like a government increasing funding to education by millions of pounds or dollars. Then I'll say, fill in all the pieces in between. Or sometimes I'll set up a what if wheel. So I'll make a statement in the middle, like what if we banned all cars within, you know, one kilometer or two miles from our school. And then I'll write four or five circles around the edge and they have to come up with consequences of doing that. And then finally, the reflection key in the critical thinking. 
I mentioned it before, though, can I also add the 2Q process? 2Q is a powerful thing to do near the end of any learning. It's two questions. The first question is, what did I do well? And the second question is, what could I have done differently? It's very powerful to use those when you are finishing off on something. And then we have the 10 creative activities, 10 thinking processes that generate innovative ideas. The first one is improvements. This is when we outright improve a product or a process or a way of doing things. I generally draw up a T chart and on one side I'll write uh, something like the present situation. So it could be something like pl uh, playground duty. So I'll simply list all the things that are being done on playground duty and how it's been operating. On the other side, the heading would be something like improvements. And so you then write a single improvement for each one of those points that you made in the left-hand column. Brainstorming is done with all of these keys, but this is where you explicitly do generate ideas for something. I find the words how to are often the best way of getting good thinking going. How to is when you go how to encourage people to uh, conserve more water, how to encourage people to donate more blood to the Red Cross. You then set some simple ground rules, uh, such as saying you want lots of ideas, uh, you don't want any judgment made, you want silly and interesting ideas, and you're allowed to tag with the ideas, and then away you go with it. The predictions key is where you determine to some degree what is going to be happening up ahead. Uh, I'm into preferable futures. It's where we decide how we want things to be up ahead, and then we backward map to now, we start to put it into place. Uh, so I will talk with children about uh, what do they believe could be happening and they, what they'd like to have happening in five years' time in their lives or in their school or in the fast food industry or the use of mobile telephony. So there's a lot to be said for the use of predictions and the use of the prediction key. In common is the probably the, the strangest of these keys, and yet it can get great thinking going. It's where I name two disparate objects that have got nothing to do with each other, such as jealousy and a wristwatch. I then ask them to come up with points that have, uh, we've got in common between the two of those. Okay, so both of them can take up a lot of your time, for example, and you can see things happening with each one of them. Then if you were asking them to write a story about jealousy, they could begin by going, jealousy is like a wristwatch because, and they've got all these great ideas they can use in it. The opposite is the next key, and that's the combination key. One of my favorites in terms of generating new ideas. With this, we sometimes drop a matrix, and along the top, we write the names of some objects. So if we were doing some work with technologies, we might put uh, cell phones or mobile phones, then we might put laptops, and we might put printers. Down the side, we then name some different objects that have got nothing to do with them, like bananas and shoelaces and you know ice cream. We then cross-reference, and every time two of those match up, such as the mobile phones and ice cream, we try and come up with a new object that could be created by drawing both of those together. You'll find that children love that. The bar key is an acronym uh, to go through a neat process of refining something. It stands for bigger, add, and replace. And you can bar anything. You can bar a product. You can bar a way of doing things. You can bar a sport. You can bar a fairy tale, you can bar anything. So if you were barring a sport, you can make one rule bigger and more important. You could ad adapt one rule, add another rule uh, that's never been put on there before. And then the R for replace, you replace one rule with another or a player's position for another. So lots of ways of using the bar key. The uh, inventions key is simply where you invent new things. And you'll often find children even enjoy just doing old fashioned drawing with this. So they might invent a homework machine or a, a dog exercise machine or a machine that can automatically clean their teeth. There are no end of possible inventions. The brick wall key is where you work out the brick wall that's standing in your way when you're trying to resolve something and then you work out how to improve things after that. So they might be trying to set up a social justice group in their college or school and so they work out the brick walls that are holding them back. So one of the brick walls could be the apathy of most students. So they begin by working out how to get around the apathy being exhibited by so many other students. It's a great way to start a lot of social justice projects. The challenge key is another of my favorites, and this is where you provoke very openly. It's a great way to start a lesson. So with the challenge key, you make a, a provocative statement that is very difficult to substantiate. So I mentioned before, that we could implant mobile phones inside our brains. Not a bad way to start a lesson in terms of technologies. 
because after that, anything seems calm with what you're going to say. Can I also make the point that if you're that serious about intellectual rigor, the first five minutes of any lesson will pretty well make or break how well that lesson will go with the quality of thinking. Do not start at a low level. Start high and then it's easier to slide down a bit, but very difficult to go the other way. And then the last thing is key is the reverse key. And that's where uh, you uh, try and generate ideas by coming up with the opposite to what you need. So, for example, you might be generating ideas on how to encourage teenagers not to eat junk food. You start by generating ideas on how to encourage them to eat junk food. You then list all the opposite ideas to those. Just be aware that if you do that, you must tell parents what you're doing because otherwise they may start to wonder. So there are the 20 keys with, for you. There are then many different ways of using them in everyday life. So, for example, I mentioned before that each has an icon. I sometimes get children to draw those icons in order with the thinking processes they're going to use and maybe put a plus sign in between each one of them. You might uh, cut up small packets of these keys. So after you get the master sheet, you cut them up into small pieces and then you put the sections inside little packets. So I have packets of these in purple cardboard and orange cardboard. I've used them with 17-year-olds and with 7-year-olds. And by the way, as part of this, uh, this webinar here, I will send out that master sheet to everyone who participated in this. If you have purchased this afterwards, please get in touch and I'll arrange for someone to send you that master sheet as well. Sometimes with the thinker's keys, you may not use them in whole sequences, but just use single keys. So I often do that in lessons that I'm giving where I hold up the key to represent what we're about to do with something. I also sometimes put up four or five of the keys along a whiteboard or a wall somewhere to indicate the process we're going to use for the whole lesson. And of course, there is the use of the, that master chart that I mentioned before in terms of thinking sequences, where they put different numbers in terms of the different ways they're going to do things. And keeping that in mind, here are three very core sequences that I believe are critical for young people today. The first one is when they are seeking solution on something. Now, not everything in life has a neat solution, but I live for the day when we have these amazing young people all over our planet who know how to create solution to something rather than feeling swamped by any issue they have in their lives. So you might start with a purpose key asking, well, what really am I doing here? What do I need to do? Where am I going with this? After that, they then generate any information they have about the particular topic. Who else has done something like this? What do I already know? Then they might come up with a core question they need to address so that they can then go further with the process. After they come up with a the question, they then generate lots of ideas. After they come up with those, they then pick one or maybe two and they make their final decision on what to do with it. And then they work out how they're going to put it into action. As I said, I live for the day when all of our amazing young people can do that anytime they're having issues with something in life. And here's a further stance on that. I occasionally even put one of the keys in the middle of that cycle. And you can go to it at any stage during the sequence. So perhaps after you've come up with your question, you might pause, go into the middle and go, hold on, was that the most effective way that we came up with that question? Is there a harder one we could have come up with? And then you'll go back into the process again. And when you get to the decision and you make one, you might go into the challenge and go, did we really push ourselves here? Or is there something even more worthwhile we could have done in terms of our final decision? So that's another way of using these. Uh, here's a second one that I think is very powerful. It's simply being able to analyze something in depth. Now, there are lots of ways of doing this, and you'll find that students will come up with other variations on them. And can I encourage that strongly? Because the real power of these thinkers' keys is not them using them in the way you tell them how to. It's in them, them designing se uh, sequences for themselves. But when you're analyzing something in depth, you could begin with the research. And after you've come up with the information, you then work out all the different perspectives that people have on that research, because a lot of it won't be just fact, it will be conjecture that has been arrived at from lots of different minds on the planet. And after they've come up with those different perspectives, they then reflect on everything that they have found in all of that. And they debrief and they come up with their summation on what they actually learned. So there is a, a, a sequence in terms of analysis. And the last one that I'll mention to you is an outright innovation process. Uh, I live for the day when we have an equal balance between the purple and the orange in education so that we have outright innovation being proposed in every classroom on the planet. Now, you know, some people in TED Talks will carry on about how important it is to do it, 
That's great. And what I want to see is the activity being done specifically. So here's one way of doing it. You might be talking about a particular issue and you might begin with the brick wall and you work out what it is that's impeding world progress on this or their personal progress or the community's progress on something. After they've worked out the brick wall, they then come up with the information that's available on a particular topic. Then they start to really push themselves in terms of the, where they could go with this. So they, they provoke and they come up with very out there comments and statements and ideas in terms of what could be done with something. After they've done that challenging, they then work out clear improvements to whatever it is they're talking about. After they do that, they then reflect on what they've done with all of this and they process it as well as they possibly can, perhaps doing a 2Q. And then they wrap up by working out the action they could take as a result of what they've come up with in that particular sequence. So there is another very worthwhile sequence for you if you do want to teach children some of those. Okay, now it would be a great time for you to do a bit of debriefing. So again, as you're listening to this, perhaps you could pause and do the what, so what, and now what. Can I start to draw some of all that thinking together with a metaphor for thinking? Now, metaphor has always exhilarated me. Forest Company's box of chocolates has always intrigued me. Watch out for any child who ever speaks in metaphor because it usually indicates there's something switched on up top. Uh, a jigsaw is a great metaphor for thinking, and here's why. Yeah, personally, I can't take jigsaws. It's beyond me why people would take a perfectly good picture and cut it up into little pieces and then put it back together again. They mustn't have much to do with their lives. However, great metaphor for thinking. Here's why. Apparently with jigsaws, you start by having all the parts in front of you and then you look around and you try and find the edge bits in most cases and you start to put all those edges together. And that's fine and it's a good way of getting it all done. Eventually, though, if it's too big a jigsaw, you can just become swamped by what you have to do and you just cannot see where you're going with it. And so you need to use the second way of doing a jigsaw, which is to go and get the cover of the jigsaw packet. And then you can see how all the parts fit into place. Now, we need to do the same when it comes to thinking in classrooms. It's great to teach specific strategies uh, to children, except now and again, they need to know where it's going. They need to have context for what they're doing. Context is critical with thinking. So it's great to use those thinkers' keys and other strategies, except they must be in context and children must have a clear sense of where they are actually going with it. And one of the great ways of doing that is with inquiry. Inquiry is critical. Now, good teachers have always done this and always will. Uh, however, we need to be very explicit about it and refer to it by that particular word. Can I make a point that it's more of a belief system than a technique? It basically means we want to get excited about what we're learning. And it's certainly not either or. Uh, my heart breaks when I hear people saying, oh, I love the sound of that inquiry, but I haven't got time. I've got to get through this material. No, it's not either or. Inquiry is often very strongly problem or project based. It's about solution whenever possible. It often focuses more on questions than just the answers. And it uses great pedagogy. So it builds in higher order thinking and deep understanding. Uh, definitely authentic projects whenever possible. And most definitely using formative assessment as compared to just summative. Formative is when children form an understanding of their understandings as they go along, as compared to just at the end. So a lot to be said for seriously looking at how you use inquiry. And here is a process for it in terms of the questions. Now, there are thousands of processes for inquiry, but these are six that I quite like in terms of some units of study. The first one is to quite simply you know, explain what's our purpose for doing this inquiry like to clearly articulate why really we are doing it. It's not a good response to go because it's in the curriculum or because we have to do it. It needs to be something deeper. And then after that, we get into prior knowledge and we work out what they already know and we brainstorm it and put it up everywhere. And then we work out the questions we want to ask. And after that, we work out the learning steps we're going to take to respond to those questions and to do this learning. And then we go even further into how to do really decent research. And then after that, we work out how we're going to put our findings into place. Are we going to put them into action? Are we going to put them into social media somewhere? We're we going to take a video. What are we going to do with it? There is a lot to be said for forming a template as the basis for a unit of study with that. Uh, it can lead to some wonderful inquiry. I sometimes just use images uh, to push the concept of inquiry. I was in Edinburgh once and I noticed all these bricked in windows in different buildings and I asked about it and finally found out that it was because of a window tax that was decreed a couple of hundred years ago 
People had to pay money when they had too many windows in their buildings. So as a result, they started to brick them in. And in fact, uh, you know, that's where, uh, you know, we first heard about, you know, people wanting to get rid of tax and not want to pay it as much as possible. Uh, so a lot to be said for just using an image to provoke inquiry. I love seeing teachers having a single image up there when in fact they're about to start a lesson. It's a great way to get the thinking going. And by the way, that's where the expression daylight robbery first came from. And as I'm starting to put all this together, can I make some points in terms of enhancing thinking with the use of ICT? I have some concern with the billions of dollars that are being spent around this planet in terms of technologies in classroom, and yet I'm not always sure that they are tangibly improving the quality of the learning. You know, like 20 years ago, I noticed that assignments were being done on shiny bits of cardboard. Uh, of, you know, children often ask their parents to buy the shiny piece because that always impresses teachers more. And then these kids would go and cut out some photos and then they'd copy from an encyclopedia. And just in case you don't know, they're those big books that used to be in libraries with, you know, letters of the alphabet on them. And yet sometimes when they did this, they had little idea about the context and they still, still scored a 17 out of 20. Unfortunately, in today's age, I'm finding the same thing going on just with the use of technology added to it. So instead of the piece of cardboard, it might be something that is a PowerPoint or a wiki or something online. And yet students sometimes still just steal images from Google. They plagiarize from various cheat sites and they've still got little idea of context. So I'm thinking to myself, has the ICT advanced their thinking? Now, when used well, it absolutely does. But when it's used badly, I think it sometimes makes it even worse than if you didn't have the technology at all. Here's a simple way of looking at this. Some people might be familiar with Wordle.net, one of the many uh, you know, visual tools available for making uh, words look more interesting. So you can take a clump of words, drop them into Wordle and make them look really pretty. And you'll find that you know, a lot of children love doing that, except there is no thinking involved. It's just a visual medium. However, I wrote an article once on, you know, some of the things happening in education down in Australia in terms of what is called NAPLAND. So I invented this fictitious country called NAPLAND and I wrote this and then I dropped it into Wordle. Now in Wordle, it makes words bigger the more often you use them. So I was able to determine which words I'd use for greater effect in my particular article. You could do the same with someone's speech and convert it into text and drop it into Wordle. And just like that, you're improving the quality of thinking that happens as a result of using that tool. You see, it's the same tool, but it can be used in many different ways. Please extrapolate from that into every tool you ever used. It can be used well or badly, depending on how it's put into place. There are some different ideas in terms of using uh, content that you put online. Please be careful about just trying to look impressive by putting a whole lot of information there. That's not enough. It needs to be interactive as much as possible. You know, have book clubs, have halls of fame for their achievements. Do something that gets them engaged with it rather than just putting it out there. The SAMR model from Ruben Putendera is an interesting one. Uh, the bottom two levels are fairly core. That's just where you're enhancing learning. The top two are powerful, and that's where you transform the learning. Substitution is just substituting one tool for another. Augmentation is when you are starting to improve things. That's where I find most of the technology use I'm seeing in classrooms around the planet. Modification couldn't have been done five years ago because we didn't have the technology at the time. It significantly gets you to redesign the task. Redefinition is probably where we'll be using wearable technology and online gaming and a whole lot of other amazing things in the years ahead to generate learning that just could never have been done before. So think about what level you're on in terms of the SEMR model. See, this guy who wrote that talks about devices needing to be curiosity amplifiers, and I love the expression. They have to amplify their curiosity and certainly not impede it, which unfortunately sometimes happens when I see classrooms where children are told to turn things on, open things up, and shut them down upon demand. And I'm not knocking that out right. I'm just saying that they need to amplify their curiosity. We're basically moving an education from enhancement to transformation. Another way of looking at that is that I believe we are moving from consumption of knowledge where we just have to consume a whole lot of it through to where we create new knowledge or even co-create it. And that's what's happening, say, in the app world with children when they're developing new apps because they love to co-create. We use YouTube to develop videos with people all over the planet 
people that they've never met before. So they are clear trends in terms of how things are happening with that technology. There are different learning theories available. And the ones in black have been around for ages. Uh, some of them are really good. Behaviorism, not so much. Constructivism, absolutely. Uh, instructivism is still very important. Sometimes you do need to clearly instruct as long as it's necessary at the time. Cognitivism is predominantly what I've been talking about in this whole session. A new learning theory called connectivism from George Siemens in Canada is definitely worth a look. For the first time in human history, according to him, this is a theory that is outside the human brain in terms of learning. So rather than just learning from inside your thinking, you're learning by making connections with others. So an example of that would be the, uh, the Genius Bar with Apple, where you go there and sit down for 20 minutes and get all of this advice from a genius behind the bar. We need more of those in education outside libraries at lunchtime, where you could have four 12-year-olds sitting with their wide up laptop, and they are geniuses in particular things, and people can come up all through the break and ask some different questions about things. So one of my big questions to you would be, where do you use connectivism? Uh, here's another really practical way of doing it. Just appoint one student a day to use a camera while she or he is still doing their own learning and to take different uh, photos that represent what is being learned about that day. This is more a primary version, but certainly secondary can do it as well. Near the end of the day, ask that student to choose five or six of those images and the class then votes on the one that is most powerful. Place that particular voting winner up into your class blog or whatever you put online and also in a diagram on the wall. Now, I've done this with teachers all over the world and I'm astonished at the recall from students when they do this because I can go up to any image from six months previously and say, what did you do on that day? And because the image is there, they can remember quite clearly what it is they had to do. So think about making use of that as much as possible. My wrap up on this is that it's not just about the technology. It's in fact about the teaching and the learning and our humanity. I would rather a teacher be a brilliant teacher with no technology than vice versa. However, a great teacher with the worthwhile resources becomes an even better teacher. Can I especially make this point too? I'm not sure what might happen in the next 10 years in education, but I can near guarantee that while technology won't replace teachers, at least for quite a while, the first ones to go will be those who don't use it. You must simply get into using it, even appoint students to be your mentors so that they help you with it as much as possible. So as I'm starting to finish off here, uh, there's my final what, so what, and now what. So it might be a great time just to do a debrief on those comments. And so as I'm finishing off here, uh, where to from here? Uh, one option could be to do a 531 on this content. Uh, choose the five points or concepts or ideas that you most liked. Then narrow them down to the three that most did it for you. And then come down with the one definitive one, which is definitely what you would take away to make use of. And after you've come up with that one, ask these questions of it. You know, what could I or we do with it? And that's a maybe. What could we do with it? Then what will we do with it? So that's definite. And then the details, how and when are we going to do it? And how will we actually keep it going? So there's a great process for you in terms of taking all this information away. Uh, some other support for you as I'm finishing off here. Uh, I'm very much into social justice and I've written a whole lot of free material at theearthmovers.org. You can download it, load it, use it to your heart's content. And I even have uh, core you know, uh, activity sheets there. And in fact, they use the thinkers keys to help children get organized when they're doing a social justice project. So you are welcome to download those, to print them out as much as you wish. I'm at Facebook uh, under Powerful Futures. This is for people who really like to have their thinking pushed. In there, I'll be talking about things like post-human states of being, where people die and they can download their entity into some artificial device so they can, in fact, live forever. So if that doesn't do it for you, then don't go near that one. I'm also in Twitter at Aussie Tony, and in there I just put lots of ideas and activities and videos and funny sayings that I find around different schools and in life in general. Uh, I have a lot of material at tonyryan.com.au, so if you'd like to go in there and click into resources especially, you'll find all sorts of different downloads and ideas that you can make use of. My wrap-up story for you. I began with one part of the world, that was Hong Kong, and I'm going to finish with another one, and it's Machu Picchu in Peru. I was there a couple of years ago and I was taking some photos when I was there and I 
took this one of the requisite llama while I was, you know, at Machu Picchu itself. That night I had to go down and stay at Aguas Calientes, one of the ultimate tourist traps on the planet. Uh, very expensive for a poor country like Peru. And that night I had to go out and eat some dinner. So I find a cafe that's on the local railway line. So you had to be very careful. You didn't have too many drinks and fall onto the line. And I had a young Peruvian guy serving me and I asked him for some llama and some vegetables and some chips. Now, I can't speak much Spanish and he couldn't speak any English, but I got across to him what I was after. And so out came my plate and this was what was on it. As well as the llama and the vegetables and the chips was a little teddy bear. And so this teddy bear is sitting there and I'm thinking, what am I supposed to do with this? I don't remember reading about this in the tourist brochures. So I picked it up and I pretended to eat it. And he is going, oh, no, senor. So I presume it was just decoration. So I finished off my meal and and when he went away, I then took this teddy bear and put it down beside my feet. And when he came back, he looked at my empty plate and he went, oh, no, presuming I'd eaten it. I put it back on the plate and he, he just sort of went, oh, phew. So he goes away with the plate. And later on, I'm talking to the person who is manager of this cafe. And he says, oh, he just likes to stir people. He puts it on their plate to see what they do. Now, I've eaten in over 20 countries and I've never had someone put a teddy bear on my plate before. My question to you is, where's your teddy bear? What's the provocation you do that excites thinking? How do children go home from your learning, your lessons, your classes, your school and say, wow, you want to see what we did today? So I'll leave you with that thought. I thank you very much for your time. May you enjoy your thinking well into the future.